Good afternoon and welcome back to uh, AMP Europe uh, 2020. It's my pleasure to be here with uh, Dirk Scheinert, who doesn't need any introduction from Leipzig, for this uh, lunch symposium that is sponsored by Concept Medical. And we'll discuss the future developments of drug eluting balloon technology for PAD. And I think the entire discussion on paclitaxel serolimus uh, started some years ago uh, with the Katsanos meta-analysis. There was a second paper. And it's also my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Konstantinos Katsanos. We'll discuss the uh, issue of overcoming paclitaxel with serolimus in PAD. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Thank you very much to Concept Medical for organizing uh, this symposium. I have been asked to discuss uh, some details and some differences between Paclitaxa and Seroimus and how they may apply to the treatment of peripheral vascular disease. So Paclitaxel is a completely different medication from Sirolimus. Paclitaxel is basically an antimitotic agent that blocks cell proliferation by binding to the intracellular tubulin and blocking spindle formation and disassembly. Whereas on the contrary, Sirolimus is basically a cytostatic agent, an immunosuppressant that binds to the intracellular receptor FKPB12 and it inhibits the activity of the mammalian TOR receptor. And then the cells are arrested in the G1 phase. So Sirolimus is a cytostatic agent, basically anti-inflammatory agent. Paclitaxel is an antimitotic, antineoplastic, basically cytotoxic agent. Now, there are also some uh, differences in terms of their uh, pharmacological properties. I'm going to highlight here that the IC50, in terms of action on the vascular or smooth muscle cells, is basically very, very similar uh, uh, between the two agents, between two and four nanomolars. However, uh, in terms of the IC50, uh, when working on endothelial cell uh, action and effects, there are several uh, orders of magnitude different. One picomolar, very, very high effectiveness of paclitaxel on endothelial cell uh, proliferation compared to only one nanomolar uh, in the case of Seolimus. And then there are also differences in terms of distribution of the two agents and in terms of their therapeutic uh, range. Now, let me give you some more details here. On the left-hand side, you can see the uh, coefficient of the diffusion of the two agents on the long axis of the vessel, uh, which is the planar, uh, and the, uh, on the short axis of the vessel across the different vessel layers, which is the transmural. And you can see that there are differences between the two. In both cases, planar is a lot more easier uh, for the agents to diffuse than transmural, and paclitaxel has a very, very uh, low uh, transmural coefficient compared to uh, Seolimus. On the right hand side, you can also note that paclitaxel partitions a lot easier to the outer vessel wall to the adventitia, whereas Seolimus rapamycin distributes evenly across all different vessel layers. Now, what about therapeutic range? Uh, this is the, what we call the therapeutic index, index is very, very wide in terms of Seolimus and very, very thin in terms of paclitaxel which means uh, that in the case of Seolimus, uh, the, uh, the agent is safe up to more than 10 milligrams per more than 10 milligrams per gram of tissue concentration, but no more than 100 in the case of paclitaxel. So the range that is safe uh, and also efficacious is different between the two, uh, between the two medications. Now, there have been the very well known and controversial concerns about uh, 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 the potential of deaths and amputations in case of paclitaxel. This is our final risk benefit uh, analysis out to five years. Uh, at the top, you can see a 62 higher percent, uh, 62 percent higher risk of death out to uh, five years. At the bottom, you can see the effect of the device in the femoral popliteal segment, uh, 42 percent lower risk of uh, target vision revascularization. Uh, some concerns also in the infrapopulitial vessels, in the infrapopulitial treatments, uh, meta-analysis published uh, last year, risk-benefit analysis out to one year, 52% higher risk of uh, all-cause death or major amputation, the composite event of amputation free survival, that is, at the bottom reduction, 47% uh, risk reduction of uh, target division revascularization. So in both cases, we have, we have an effect, but also some safety concerns. 
It's in particular uh, and very, very relevant to the risk of amputations in the royal limbs. It seems that the current generation draconid balloons, they uniform and universally suffer from what we call paclitaxel uh, particle distal embolization. You can see different, uh, uh, different, different uh, draconid balloons at the top. Bottom left, uh, a trend towards higher uh, risk of major amputations uh, at one year from the impact deep study. And also you can see here some benchmark, uh, some bench data from animal studies uh, where there was a dose dependent uh, concentration of paclitaxia in the skin of the hind limbs of, uh, of the animals that were treated with different numbers of the coated balloons. So it does embolize to the distal small vessels and there might be higher risk of amputations. Let's have a look on the hearing vascular response. This is data from animal studies in the coronary circulation, and it basically shows that Cerorimus has is associated with significantly lower scores of inflammation compared to paclitaxel. However, endothelialization scores seem to be pretty much identical. This is the aggregating stance in the coronary vessels. Uh, uh, going back to vessel inflammation, there is evidence that uh, paclitaxel seems, uh, because of its distribution in the outer vessel wall, it seems to cause the very, very same thing in the fempop segment. Left hand side, you can see this uh, hypoechoic, hypoechoic halo of uh, a vessel wall edema, confirmed also in this publication where they did contrast enhanced magnetic resonance angiograms. You can see the uh, contrast uptake at the outer vessel wall uh, layer. The clinical significance is still uh, remains still to be seen. Now, in terms of efficacy, we have some evidence comparing paclitaxel uh, eluting stents and uh, serolimus eluting stents from the coronary randomized studies. Uh, uh, the y axis on the left is the target region of vascularization rate, and the x axis is the red women loss. And in all uh, of those cases, five randomized head to head studies, you can see that serolimus was more effective in inhibiting restenosis and reducing target region of vascularization. The same can be said from this uh, analysis here that illustrates a number of different studies comparing head to head the cipher with the paclitaxel eluding taxostem. And again, in all cases, you may know that instant stenosis was higher with the use of paclitaxel compared to serolimus. So in conclusion, it seems that serolimus has a more favorable pharmacologic profile than paclitaxel. It has shown more effective anti properties in the coronary arteries, and in light of the recent paclitaxel safety concerns, it may be a reasonable alternative for the lower limbs. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Katsanos, uh, for uh, setting the stage and giving us this overview uh, about uh, serolimus as a true alternative uh, to paclitaxel. The next uh, talk uh, will be given by Alok Finn. He's going to speak uh, about the magic touch uh, serolimus coated uh, balloon technology using the nanolute uh, illusion uh, technology. Alok. Hi, I'm Alok Finn. I'm going to uh, talk about the magic touch serolimus coated balloon with nanolute technology basically give you prospects and appraisal of paclitaxel insights from the latest preclinical data. Here are my disclosures. So as you all know, drug-coated balloons are commonly used for above the knee disease for peripheral artery disease. And you can see they all have something in common. They all basically have a paclitaxel coating, different excipients, but the paclitaxel dose range ranges from about three to two to three micrograms per millimeter squared. But sarolimus and paclitaxel are fundamentally different types of drugs. And you know, we use sarolimus predominantly in the coronary. Paclitaxel has been used in the periphery. Sarolimus is used in the coronary basically because it's more of a cytostatic drug. Although it inhibits the mTOR complex, it really doesn't kill cells until it gets at very high doses. Paclitaxel, on the other hand, is a cytotoxic drug and it binds the beta tubulin and impairs microtubular disassembly and halts the cell cycle between G2 and M, really causing cellular death. And that's one of the big problems of paclitaxel. That's shown here in this set of experiments done by Heldman in porcine coronary arteries, where they use different doses of paclitaxel on coronary stents. And they looked at neonatal area, neonatal fibrin, and medial wall cell necrosis. And you can see as the dose of paclitaxel on the stent was increased, neonatal area did go down. So there's inhibition of restenosis, but neonatal fibrin and medial wall cell necrosis both went up. Both markers of delayed healing and arterial wall destruction, essentially. We don't wanna have 
medial cell wall necrosis. And you can see what happens at the high dose paclitaxel stent. You get massive malapposition, partly because of the amount of necrosis that occurs with high dose paclitaxel. So what are the potential benefits of sirolimus over paclitaxel? Well, they both inhibit muscle cell proliferation and migration. Perhaps sirolimus is better than paclitaxel in terms of migration. They both also inhibit endothelial cell proliferation. The therapeutic range of uh, sirolimus is considered wide, whereas for paclitaxel considered narrow, and the safety margin is much wider for sirolimus than paclitaxel. They both have anti resinotic impact, as I mentioned. The problem, of course, with using sirolimus is that its tissue absorption is slow and its tissue retention is short. Paclitaxel has a quick tissue absorption and long tissue retention, probably one reason why it was chosen as the earlier drug for drug-coated balloons. But what are the problems of paclitaxel? We showed in a preclinical study uh, published a few years ago that when you use these balloons in a preclinical model, uh, the illo and balloon the iliofemoral region, you look at downstream drug concentrations in histology, you find emboli of paclitaxel downstream, and that was done in this experiment. You can see here in the graph, what I show is that for both the Lutonix paclitaxel looting balloon and the impact paclitaxel looting balloon, there was significant downstream emboli found both in the single balloon and overlapping balloons at 28 and 90 days. And you, when you look at downstream paclitaxel concentrations, in the beds downstream of the balloon site, you can see the skeletal muscle and coronary band areas had detectable paclitaxel concentrations, much higher for impact than Latonix, but nonetheless, both were found. In terms of downstream effects, this is what we found, essentially uh, fibrinoid necrosis in downstream arterioles in the skeletal muscle region, as well as actually solid phase crystalline paclitaxel in those arterioles of the skeletal muscle, areas where you really don't want to have paclitaxel going. And what's the problem? Well, we know all we all know from the Katsanos meta-analysis done now a number of years ago that when we when he looked at the meta-analysis of randomized trials of paclitaxel looting devices uh, and compared the two arms, the PTA or the non-drug-coded arm to the paclitaxel eluding device arm, there was a higher risk of all-cause death at two years and at five years. And this is what got the FDA to issue a warning about the use of paclitaxel. Well, sirolimus is another option, but we have to do two things in order to improve its use on balloons. We have to enhance tissue resorption, absorption. We have to get it into the arterial tissue and let it stick there somehow. And we have to extend its retention. We have to allow it to be there over time so that it has an anti resinotic benefit. Well, the magic touch sirolimus coated balloon is essentially the, one of the solutions to this. Basically, it encapsulates the uh, sirolimus in microparticles phospholipid microparticles and transfers those to the arterial wall where they stay and deliver drug over the course of about 60 days. And that's seen here in the coronary swine model. You can see when we look at tissue levels of sirolimus uh, over time using the uh, magic touch balloon, you can see uh, levels of sirolimus are detectable up to 60 days, means successful drug transfer, and it was able to stay and elute over time. Well, we did a preclinical study in the porcine iliofemoral model to look at the effects of the magic touch balloon versus a control balloon. We used the 3x dosing versus a control balloon in the iliofemoral region. And in animals, we really don't look at resinosis because it's a low injury model. We look at signs of drug effect, proteoglycans, muscle cell loss, both depth and circumference. And what we found uh, with this experiment was that the magic touch balloon had signs of drug effect, that it was able to successfully transfer a drug to the arterial wall. You can see in the pharmacokinetic data, and this was done in the porcine coronary artery model, we looked at drug levels of sirolimus after balloon angioplasty of the pig. And you can see that we found that levels of uh, blood sirolimus concentrations quickly went down to be below detectable at 33 days, whereas we were able to find the sirolimus in the treated artery at 33 days uh, in both, both animals we looked at, whereas proximal and distal sections uh, did not have any detectable sirolimus. And most importantly, we were not able to detect sirolimus in the downstream myocardium, downstream the treated area, showing you there was really no essential embolization of sirolimus downstream. In terms of organs, we found that there was very little sirolimus detectable in organs, except for a very small amount in the liver, showing we got the sirolimus where we needed to get it, but it didn't go into downstream uh, non-target beds. So in summary, neonatal hyperplasia is the main cause of restenosis, and pharmacologic, pharmacologic agents in DCB and DES 
mill inhibits muscle cell proliferation. The most common antiproliferative agent for DCBs is currently paclitaxel. However, I think I showed you as a narrow therapeutic window, and there are questions about the safety of, of uh, paclitaxel limiting devices at two and five years, according to the meta-analysis of Katsanos. The Magic Touch Seralimus DCB has a novel coding technology allowing better tissue retention of Seralimus drug. Our preclinical studies support the efficacy of the Magic Touch Seralimus coded balloon. Uh, there was really anti-resynodic effect with minimal non-target organ drug levels were observed. So I think the Magic Touch DCB is emerging as an important non-paclitaxel option for peripheral and coronary intervention. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Loki. And the next presentation is coming from uh, Singapore. Edward Chok will give us an update on the six-month results of the EXTOSI trial that involved SFA and BTK treatment, but also an update on the future SFA and BTK randomized control trials. Edward. Thank you very much, Concept Medical, for inviting me to this symposium. This presentation is on the six months results of Magic Touch PTA Serolimus coated balloon for SFA and BTK disease, the XTOC trial, and also updates on the future SFA and future BTK randomized control trials. These are my disclosures. XTOC clinical trial is designed to investigate the clinical use and safety of the magic touch serolimus coda balloon in the treatment of peripheral arterial disease. It is a prospective pre-market, non-randomized, all-commerce single arm trial. 50 patients were recruited. The efficacy endpoint was defined as primary patency at six months, assessed by duplex peak systolic velocity ratio of less than or equals to 2.4. Safety endpoint was a composite of freedom from 30-day mortality and amputation, and also freedom from six months target lesion revascularization. 55 patients were screened, of which five failed screening. 50 patients were enrolled, of which 20 patients were femoral popliteal, and 30 patients were below the knee. 40 patients reached the primary patency endpoint uh, at six months, of the 10 that did not reach the primary patency endpoint at six months, six had died, one underwent uh, target limb amputation, one withdrew due to target limb fracture, and two patients did not attend their six months ultrasound follow-up. And these are the demographics of the 50 patients. These were mostly high-risk patients with critical limb ischemia. 90% of them were diabetic. One fifth of them were already on dialysis and about a third had coronary artery disease. In terms of their ASA scores, 80% of them had ASA scores of three or four. Majority were critical limb ischemia patients. 94% were Rutherford scores of five or six. And in those patients with wounds, more than half had Wi-Fi scores of four uh, and above. In terms of the lesion characteristics, most of the lesions were long and hostile. The length of the lesion had a mean of about 227 millimeters. About a third were completely occluded. 8% required stent use, and about one quarter required retrograde access to cross the target lesion. And this is the key slide summarizing the primary endpoint of six months primary patency. When considering the whole group, the six months primary patency was 80%. When sub-analyzed in just the femoral popliteal group, the six months primary patency was 88%. And just for comparison, I've put down here figures from the paclitaxel drug coded balloon from the major randomized control trials. The Ranger RCT six months primary patency was about 87%. And for Levant 2 Lutonix RCT, this was about 90%. So the XOC six months primary patency of 88% was quite comparable to the Paclitaxel drug coded balloon. However, obviously these are all different trials uh, uh, with different trial designs, but this is just a useful uh, generalized uh, gauge of the efficacy of the Serolimus coded balloon. For below the knee, the six months primary patency was 74%. And when compared to the single Paclitaxel drug coded balloon for BTK, 
which only had a six months primary pendency of 42%, the serolimus coated balloon appeared to be uh, superior to the paclitaxel drug coated balloon. But obviously, again, these are different trials, and therefore this has to be uh, uh, taken uh, with a, 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 you know, it's just a generalized guide as to the efficacy of the serolimus coated balloon. In terms of six months freedom from major adverse events, for the entire group, this was about 86%. For femoral popliteal group, it was 89%. For below the knee, it was 84%. Six months freedom from target lesion revascularization for the whole group was 90%. For femoral popliteal, this was 94%. And for below the knee, it was about 87%. In terms of six months amputation free survival, this was about 86% for the whole group, 90% for femoral popliteal, and 82% for below the knee. In terms of complications, for immediate complications, we did not see any evidence of device failure, technical failure, distal embolization, or target vessel thrombosis. At 30 days, the major complications included myocardial infarction in four patients, congestive cardiac failure in one patient, one patient had stroke, and two patients had pneumonia. At 30 days, there was one death for, uh, from ischemic heart disease. At six months, there were three deaths from ischemic heart disease in total, one from pneumonia and one from stroke. One patient died elsewhere, and therefore we do not have any uh, 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 idea of uh, uh, the cause of death for this patient. At six months, there was one amputation of the major limb of the target uh, lesion. In terms of toe pressures at six months, we saw a sustained improvement in both femoral popliteal and also the below the knee group. And this was statistically significant. So in summary, Magic Touch PTA showed promising six months primary pendency. For femoral popliteal, this was about 88%, even in a cohort of critical limb ischemia patients with hostile lesions. For below the knee, the six months primary patency was uh, about 74%, which was very promising. It also showed a good safety profile with excellent amputation free survival and freedom from target lesion revascularization at six months. Now, obviously the XOC trial is just uh, a pilot study uh, in a small group of patients and it is, a, it is a single arm trial. We have now gone on to a randomized controlled trial of serolimus coated balloon versus standard balloon angioplasty. And there are two such ongoing trials. The future SFA, looking at lesions in femoral popliteal areas. The target recruitment is 153 patients uh, aiming to recruit patients with Rutherford scores three to six. The second trial is the future BTK trial, looking at BTK lesions. We are targeting recruitment for 210 patients with Rutherford scores of four to six. Both trials will be quadruple blinded in which participants, care providers, investigators, and outcome assessors will all be blinded. There will be two to one enrollment, two to the serolimus coated balloon, one to plano balloon angioplasty. There are 12 sites currently participating across three countries. Both trials will be CRO controlled and collab adjudicated in terms of its angiogram and angioplasty in the index procedure, and also in the follow-up scans by duplex scans. And this is the general uh, design of the trials. PAD patients will be screened for eligibility. Those eligible patients will be consented and all will undergo standard angioplasty. And during the standard angioplasty, they will be assessed as to whether they fulfill all inclusion and exclusion criteria. Only after they fulfill the inclusion and exclusion criteria will they be randomized to either placebo, which is the standard balloon angioplasty, or to receive the serolimus drug coated balloon. All patients will be followed up for 24 months. The primary outcome will be six months primary patency defined as duplex peak systolic velocity ratio of less than or equals to 2.4 as adjudicated by a core lab in a blinded and independent fashion. I'm pleased to say that enrollment has already commenced in August 2020 for both future SFA and future BTK trials. And we hope to present the six months results by July 2022 if the recruitment goes as.
planned. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Choke. Uh, great overview and exciting new project. Um, the next uh, speaker is going to be Dr. Uh, Professor Ulf Teichgerber from Jena, Germany. He's going to introduce you uh, into a new exciting study uh, concept, the Seroni stu Serona study, which is a head-to-head -head comparison of a Serolimus versus Pactotaxel drug looting balloon in the femoral propitial arteries. Ulf? Hello, my name is Ulf Teichgraber. I'm the principal investigator of the Serona trial. Um, Serona trial is a head-to-head -head comparison of Serolimus versus Paclitaxel drug in eluting balloon angioplasty in the femoral popliteal artery. In the following, I'm uh, showing you the um, study protocol of our randomized controlled trial. Here are my disclosures. Well, um, serolimus represents an alternative to paclitaxel. Paclitaxel is a cytotoxic drug, uh, well, um, well established uh, for um, um, balloon angioplasty and uh, many um, products are available. Um, in the meantime, there is a discussion about the safety um, of uh, paclitaxel uh, as there might be a uh, trend uh, towards all cause mortality after two years uh, for patients uh, which were treated with paclitaxel DCBs. Cirolimus, uh, as a, a, a cytostatic drug, seems to have um, a different uh, risk profile and is well established uh, in the coronaries uh, for a stent angioplasty. The purpose of our uh, trial is to evaluate the safety and efficacy of the um, uh, Magic Touch um, uh, DCB serolimus drug-coated balloon as compared um, to uh, Paclitaxel drug-coated balloon as control group in patients with uh, femoral propitial artery disease. Our study design, it is a prospective international multi-sender one-to-one uh, non-inferiority trial. We are going to um, um, recruit a quite high um, um, population of patients, 478 patients we intend uh, to recruit. That means uh, nearly 240 patients per study arm suffering from PAD ranging from intermittent claudications to critical limb ischemia. More than uh, 25 um, sites will participate in our trial uh, from uh, um, Germany, um, from the north of Germany, just to um, Austria. As you can see, there are very prominent, uh, well-known uh, uh, sites uh, who will uh, participate in this trial. Um, with this uh, power of uh, more than 25 sites, we intend to um, finish our recruitment within one year. Uh, here are my eligibility um, criteria uh, for this trial. The inclusion criteria are uh, Rutherford category two to four, and we are mainly focusing on uh, de novo um, stenotic lesions, but also restenotic lesions uh, are allowed with a, a degree of 70% of uh, restenosis. Um, the lesion lengths uh, we intend uh, is ranging from uh, minimum five centimeters up to 30 centimeters. So we are also including long lesions. And uh, the only exclusion criteria are very calcified lesions and major amputation. Here are our, our endpoints. So um, this trial is quite ambitious. On the one hand side, we have uh, quite a lot of endpoints we are um, evaluating. Uh, our primary endpoint will be the uh, patency rate, which is defined as absence of clinical driven TLR. Um, or restenosis uh, measured by Doppler with a um, PVR um, higher than uh, 2.4, evaluated by duplex ultrasound. And secondary endpoints are TLR rate, Rutherford, um, walking capacities, 
and uh, also quality of life questionnaires, ABI, and uh, binary stenosis. A safety endpoint, we are looking at uh, freedom from device and procedure-related death after um, 60 months, and also um, for freedom from target limb amputation and clinical driven T uh, TVR. And as you can see, uh, we are evaluating our endpoints at five, one month, six months, 12, two years, three years, four years, and five years, up to five years. So we are also looking at long-term um, outcome. Here's our, our study flow. I don't want to go into detail, but uh, as it is a randomized controlled uh, trial, we do the patient allocation um, and to, to, to guarantee that both um, um, groups are treated the same way. Um, the uh, randomization will uh, uh, take place after the first angiogram. That means when the patient is already on the table and the decision for um, the angioplasty is already done. So the pre-dilatation has to be first uh, firstly done, and then we are, we are randomizing our patients so that it's clear that both patient groups are really um, um, treated the same way. And, um, and then we have uh, the discharge of our patient and then the follow-up period. So the hypothesis is uh, of our, our hypothesis is that the DCB has been questions after uh, Cassano's uh, meta-analysis in 2018, and also confirmed by uh, Klum's meta-analysis, described uh, which which described an association between paclitaxel dose and mortality risk. Considering the possible risk in correlation with the treatment of PAD patients with paclitaxel coated balloons, we assume that the treatment of commercially available um, serolimus coated balloon is non-inferiority regarding um, efficacy and safety. And the best way uh, to, to show this is really to prove this with a randomized controlled trial with uh, enough power. And we think with this trial, we are really uh, we are really able to answer this uh, crucial question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ulf, for this uh, overview of the Serona trial. Uh, that is the second trial that we uh, discussed, randomized, and we now have uh, Niels Kuchen, who will discuss the SEERPAD, which is another randomized trial using a serolimus coated balloon. Niels. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Niels Kucher um, from the University Hospital of Zurich, Switzerland. And I'm happy to present uh, the rational and the protocol of the CIAPAT randomized controlled clinical trial. The rationale of CIAPAT is the following. Um, uh, I really have to say that in, P in the field of PAD, uh, in contrast, for example, to coronary uh, patients, um, there has never been really a big study that was powered for important clinical outcomes. In fact, prior randomized trials in patients with peripheral arterial disease were small sized. They only used surrogate outcomes like binary restenosis or TLR. There were clearly restrictive eligibility criteria. Um, that means that uh, uh, in, in all studies, there were highly selected patients, which we know uh, do not reflect clinical routine practice. No randomized trial has ever, uh, has ever been performed in the PAD population to find out if an endovascular intervention may improve important clinical outcomes. What are important clinical outcomes? Amputation and revascularization for critical limb ischemia. Drug-coated balloons and drug-looting stents were developed to prevent neointimal proliferation and restenosis. There is a big debate about paclitaxel, um, which is already dead in the coronary field because many years ago, safety concerns were already expressed in the coronary field. And also in the PID population, there's more and more controversy regarding the safety and also regarding the efficacy of uh, this kind of drug. Limus is a drug of choice for coronary drug looting stents without safety concerns, because likely there are, uh, Limus is less toxic to the vessel wall 
uh, in fact, it's uh, cytostatic and it is not cytotoxic like Paclitaxel. The CIPAD randomized trial uh, is the first clinical all comer trial, so a non selective population of PID where an angioplasty is performed below the inguinal ligament, either on the thigh or on the calf. Patients uh, requiring endovascular angioplasty uh, actually are eligible if there is uh, a plant angioplasty of any vessel below the uh, inguinal ligament. During angiography, the interventionalist will define the target lesion, which is most likely responsible for the patient's sign and symptoms fulfilling uh, angiographic criteria, as you can see here. So there should be a, a, an angiographic stenosis, a significant stenosis, and at least a single plane in the fempop axis or in the below the knee arteries. There's a screening phase, like in all uh, uh, studies, where um, non-invasive uh, tests are performed, baseline characteristics are taken, and of course, vascular ultrasound belongs uh, to, to the clinical screening phase. The angiographic screening phase uh, is there to define the target lesion and, um, and act actually um, confirm that the patient is eligible for uh, randomization. The intervention uh, group is patients uh, uh, get a magic touch, so erythrolimus coated balloon angioplasty. Um, there, as you know, there's all, all sizes are CE certified in the meantime, so all 35 systems, or 18 systems, or 14 systems. The control group is any available CE certified uncoated balloon catheter with application and PID approved for inpatient use in Switzerland. For the first time, CIAPAD will look uh, for an important primary, primary efficacy outcome, which is a composite of two major adverse limb events, so-called male outcome, which is a composite of unplanned major amputation of the target limb and endovascular or surgical target lesion revascularization for critical limb ischemia within all within one year of enrollment. Uh, CIAPAD also for the first time has, has a hierarchical analysis, meaning that, uh, 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 that we have two uh, steps in the analysis of the outcomes. First, we, uh, the, the study should show superiority for the composite out, outcome of unplanned amputations and any target lesion revascularization, also those who were not performed for critical limb ischemia. If that superiority is shown, uh, CIAPAD will allow for testing superiority for the male outcome within one year after enrollment. CIAPAD will also be the largest randomized trial that has ever been performed uh, for the PID population actually enrolling 1,200 patients. And you will not believe it, it is a single center trial, uh, but we will be able to, to uh, get these patients within two years because it's an all comer study. So all patients, more or less, will uh, be enrolled in that trial. And how can we do it? Because we have four scenarios. I don't have the time to go into detail, but we will even recruit patients who are intubated, who are on, on intensive care units. Um, uh, and and um, there will be very few patients who will not be eligible for the trial. Just one of my last slides here, you see the study flowchart. There's the uh, informed consent and clinical screening. There's the angiographic screening, randomization. Uh, there is uh, in-hospital visits, and there is three uh, actually uh, office visits, uh, if possible. So there are routine visits. visits. Uh, it is also allowed, allowed to uh, have telephone visits if the patients will not be uh, controlled in our hospital. And this is possible because we are just looking for hard clinical outcomes and it will uh, be unlikely that we will miss uh, important uh, outcomes like uh, major amputations or uh, critical limb ischemia leading to urgent revascularization. So last slide, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, CIAPAD is the first randomized all-comer trial in the PID population. It is also the first PID interventional trial to assess important clinical outcomes and not just binary restenosis or any TLR. 
CIPAT will find out whether Lemos drug can prevent restenosis and improve leg outcomes in unselected patients with PAD. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Niels. Uh, another exciting study project. I think with that, we go back to uh, Dr. Choke. He will share with us some uh, case experiences uh, with uh, the Cerolimus coated uh, balloon, both in BTK uh, and the SFA region. Uh, thank you, uh, Concept Medical, for inviting me to this symposium. Um, in this presentation, I will be presenting two case reviews of Magic Touch Cerolimus coated balloon for peripheral arterial disease. These are my disclosures. Magic Touch PTA uh, drug coated balloon has, in my experience, showed no flaking or distal embolization. And for me, this makes this drug coated balloon ideal for small BTK arteries. In case one, I will be showing an example of a below the knee Cerolimus coated balloon application. This was a participant in the XOC trial uh, where the patient had uh, a Rutherford uh, 5 uh, lesion, critical limb ischemia in the form of right foot big toe gangrene with infection spreading up the dorsum of the foot. And to the left, you can see the preoperative duplex scan showing extensive diffuse below the knee disease. And for this patient, my target was the anterior tibial artery to try and achieve inline flow uh, into the uh, 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 right big toe. And there is diffuse disease of the anterior tibial artery. And this is the uh, angiogram uh, during the procedure. Um, and after successful uh, plain old balloon angioplasty, I applied serolimus coated balloon to the entire length of the uh, anterior tibial artery to achieve inline flow, as you can see from this uh, post POBA and post SCB angiogram. So, in this procedure, I applied Cerolimus coated balloon uh, to the proximal anterior tibial artery, mid anterior tibial artery, and also to distal anterior tibial artery, encroaching a little bit into the dorsalis pedis. In terms of the results, uh, to the left, you can see the duplex ultrasound of the index uh, before the index procedure, showing the diffuse disease in the anterior tibial artery with monophasic signals in the distal dorsalis pedis. At six months, uh, I'm pleased to say that the anterior tibial artery demonstrates no significant arterial disease, and the dorsalis pedis demonstrated triphasic waveforms. And uh, it is important to maintain patency up to six months because for patients with critical limb ischemia and extensive wounds, this is sometimes how long it takes for the wound to heal, if not even longer sometimes. So for this patient, the patient uh, had the procedure done in March and throughout the month of April, at about one month's time, it showed good progress, but for the wound to completely heal, it took a total of five months. So if the anterior tibial artery had uh, 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 recurrent disease during this time, then the wound may have stopped healing and the patient may have needed a second procedure to, to, to revascularize the recurrent disease. This patient now has followed up at 12 months and I'm pleased to say that the anterior tibial artery had remained patent at 12 months. And again, the dorsalis pedis showed triphasic waveforms at 12 months. Case two is on a pedal arch serolimus coated balloon. So we know that the Magic Touch PTA serolimus coated balloon showed no flaking or dislambalization then we can push the boundaries a little bit more. So how low can you actually go? And what about below the ankle application of Cerolimus coated balloon? In this case, this is a 76 year old gentleman with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, heavy smoker with a non-healing right shin ulcer, which has been present for one month. And the angiogram shows that the only vessel running to the foot is a peroneal artery, both anterior tibial artery and posterior tibial arteries were completely occluded. Further down in the foot, again, the dominant vessel is the peroneal artery. Some distal reconstitution of the posterior tibial artery to the lateral plantar artery, but very little in the form of anterior tibial artery or dorsalis pedis artery. However, in this patient, as the lesion is in the front of the foot, the angiosome target is the anterior tibial artery. And that was what I went for. 
to get wire into the anterior tibial artery successfully, this was a complex uh, uh, wire crossing uh, requiring two stages. Uh, firstly, a retrograde puncture of the posterior tibial artery in order to cross the uh, um, posterior tibial artery uh, chronic total occlusion. After which is a plantar petal uh, loop approach to loop approach to get the wire into the anterior tibial artery in a retrograde fashion. After application of uh, 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 a normal uh, uh, plano balloon angioplasty, this is the application of a 2.5 millimeter magic touch serolimus coated balloon across the pedal arch followed by 2.5 millimeter magic touch PTA serolimus coated balloon to uh, uh, distal anterior tibial artery. And finally, application of a three millimeter magic touch serolimus coated balloon to the proximal anterior tibial artery. And this is the final angiogram showing good flow down the uh, anterior tibial artery into the dorsalis pedis artery, round the pedal arch into the lateral plantar artery, and also uh, uh, good flows down the posterior tibial artery with no evidence of distal lambalization, no slow flow, no snow, uh, slow, slow flow phenomenon from the uh, flaking or anything like that. And further up the top, you can see uh, reconstitution of the trifurcation with good flows down the anterior tubule artery where most of the serolimus coated balloon was uh, applied. So Magic Touch PTA for PAD has the nanolube technology. In terms of its uh, nano carrier, it uses the organic liposome. And I think this has a part to play in the fact that there is no distal embolization and also no flaking. It appears to be safe for small vessels especially for below the knee arteries and also for the plantar arch artery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shaw. And we just continue uh, instantly with uh, your early experience on uh, the agluminous DS stand for BTK disease, which is the next iteration of course. Thank you, Concept Medical, for inviting me into this symposium. In this presentation, I will be presenting our early experience with using the abluminous serolimus coated stent for PTK arteries. These are my disclosures. The abluminous PTK trial, which started just one month ago, is a prospective single arm trial to assess the performance of the abluminous PTK serolimus eluding stent for the treatment of below the knee arterial disease. The primary effective endpoint is primary patency, defined as duplex ultrasound at six months post-procedure. The primary safety endpoint is defined as major adverse events at six months, which is a composite of an above ankle amputation of the index limb, major reintervention, and also perioperative mortality. The plan is to enroll a total of 30 patients. Prior to the Abluminous trial, we have pre-trial experience of using the Abluminous drug eluding stents in 10 patients. All 10 patients had severe critical limb ischemia where eight of them had Rutherford scores of six. We now have results of six months follow-up for these 10 patients. In six months, one patient died from acute myocardial infarction. Three patients had major limb amputations and I will go into detail on, uh, uh, on these three patients into major, which had major limb amputations. Six reached the six months duplex follow-up. And in these six patients, all the aluminous patients uh, stents had remained patent at six months, 100% primary patency in these six patients. So this is one of the uh, uh, patients. This was a 62 year old lady with ischemic heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and stage renal failure presented with right big toe gangrene. In terms of the duplex, most of the disease is in the popliteal artery, extending down into the uh, anterior tibial artery. So the target was to revascularize and obtain inline flow into the anterior tibial artery. With the catheter in the popliteal artery, we can see the heavily diseased popliteal artery and also severe disease of the proximal anterior tibial artery. So we use conventional balloon angioplasty to uh, open up the 
popliteal artery and also the uh, anterior tibial artery at this stage. And this was the result showing reasonable uh, uh, flow down the popliteal artery and anterior tibial artery. However, in the proximal ATA, you can see that there's some dissection and proximally there is a very recalcitrant uh, stenosis in the uh, origin of the anterior tubular artery. So I felt that this had to be treated with a stand as a scaffold. Otherwise, my confidence level of uh, this achieving patency in six months was quite low. So I used the abdominus drug eluding stand. The abdominus stent is a monorail uh, stent over an 014 wire and it tracks very smoothly uh, uh, through the lesion, as you can see here. In terms of deployment, this is a balloon mounted stent, which means you can deploy it fairly accurately, which is uh, 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 much needed for uh, lesions like this, where you have to accurately place the stent in the proximal ATA without jailing the tibial perineal trunk. So this is the end result uh, uh, of the deployment of the abdominal stent showing accurate deployment of the abdominal stent all the way up to the origin of the anterior tibial artery with no jailing of the uh, tibial perineal trunk. So this is the six months follow up in this patient, uh, duplex scan showing that the stent had remained uh, nicely patent in the proximal anterior tibial artery. And at 12 months, I'm pleased to say that the abdominal stent had uh, remained patent. In terms of clinical follow-up, this was the original lesion in October last year. And I saw the patient a few days ago in my clinic and the patient underwent total uh, well transmetatarsal amputation. And, and I'm pleased to say that uh, the transmetatarsal amputation had completely healed. There are no new lesions and the patient has got no rest pain. And the patient's doing uh, very well. Of the three patients who had major limb amputations, these three patients presented with severe limb ischemia and gangrene in the first place, and they had poor prognosis for limb salvage. This was patient, one of the patients which had severe heel necrosis and severe duskiness of the uh, uh, forefoot. And ultimately, despite uh, successful revascularization, this patient had to undergo major limb amputation. This was the second patient who underwent major limb amputation, uh, presented with severe gangrene of the toes, resulting in transmetatarsal amputation. And in fact, this patient did quite well a few months afterwards, showing nice granulation tissue. However, in about the fourth month, presented with severe sepsis, uh, with pus uh, dripping out from the uh, forefoot. And ultimately, the patient had to undergo a above knee amputation. This was the third patient who presented with uh, um, nasty gangrene, uh, initially debrided to amputation by the orthopedic team, uh, referred to the vascular team with severe uh, uh, non-healing wound and ultimately uh, 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 needing to undergo major limb amputation. So in summary, uh, we have comments on the abluminous uh, serolimus eluding stem as a first in man trial for BTK disease. I believe that the uh, abluminous uh, serolimus codostan may uh, offer further options to maintain patency of BTK vessels for critical limb ischemia patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chok, and also to the other speakers uh, that are joining us now for the uh, panel discussion. Konstantinos Katsanos, Robbie Finn, uh, welcome. Also you, uh, Edward, uh, welcome to this uh, session. I have a question regarding the design of the randomized trials. We have seen uh, three randomized trials being presented. One comparing with drug-coated technology and the other two uh, comparing with POBA. What are your thoughts on this, uh, Edward, but also uh, Konstantinos? Um, well, I believe uh, all are, are, are needed. Um, for me, uh, there's actually never been any proof of any efficacy of serolimus over drug-coated balloons, over um, the plain old balloon angioplasty. So I think the first step is to show that serolimus coated balloon, whether it has any uh, uh, superiority over uh, just conventional balloon. And obviously, after doing that, then the Sirona trial is very important as a head-to-head -head comparison to show uh, whether there's any difference between serolimus and package actual drug coated balloon. 
Uh, uh, Yos, I think uh, I think that we need any kind of study design. I mean, uh, the field in the peripheral space has moved on. We know that some form of drug evolution is necessary. So I guess designs comparing head to head in a non-inferiority design versus papitaxel and superiority study designs versus control proba are necessary uh, 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 both ways. And of course, it all depends whether also the patient populations being recruited in those studies are quite similar. So touching on the endpoints presented, for example, by the SILPAD study, this is very, very important because we are moving on from creating patency also to male amputations and uh, the, the, the more important uh, outcomes. Thank you. May I add something to this? Um, I, I, I would completely agree with what Edward and Constantino said. I think uh, particularly uh, looking at the situation with the packed detaxel coated devices, of course, they are currently now uh, recommended for patients with a very high risk of restenosis. So likely uh, the study population of those comparative head-to-head -head studies will be rather complex, uh, including a lot of patients with, uh, yeah, by, by definition, high risk of restenosis, CTOs, big plug burden, and, and, and so forth. So I think to really fill the full spectrum um, of, uh, uh, you know, of the lesions, um, also these other studies, you know, which uh, go uh, against POBA uh, are very important. Normally, they would be the first step anyway. Um, and uh, they would add important information also for probably less complex lesions uh, in, in, in the trial. Thank you for this uh, this remark and this uh, additional observation. Uh, question to Alok, is there any biological or pathological reason why serolimus would work better in the PTK vessels than pacotexel? Uh, we know that it works better in the coronaries. But is that, is that something that we can extrapolate to the PTK? I think you're talking about two different things. One is the site of the treatment, which I think serolimus is long. The problem with serolimus, of course, is that it needs a carrier. It needs something to house it and elude it over time. So as long as the carrier, for, and all the balloons of serolimus could balloons have carriers, for, for example. As long as the carrier itself is non-toxic, which it can be, and allows elution for a long period of time, I'd say at least 30 to 60 days, then we're gonna have very good success. The other important aspect of serolimus is distal embolization. As you know, with paclitaxel eluding balloons, we get some evidence of distal embolization and paclitaxel really is not a good thing to have in non-target areas. I think serolimus will be dealt with, they may have some distal embolization, but it'll be dealt with much better in terms of perfusion. So I anticipate overall maybe better result with serolimus as long as we can make the carrier non-toxic and have the elution kinetics be favorable for restenosis. Thank you. Any other remarks from your side, uh, Dirk? Uh, I see that we're almost uh, ready to, uh, to wrap up this, uh, this session. No, I think the, uh, the the symposium was really comprehensive. You know, uh, I think we learned a lot about uh, yeah, serolimus as a new potential drug here for uh, uh, the application in the, uh, the peripheral arteries. We, uh, I think, we are excited to see so many study projects be run at the same time. Uh, uh, I think that's that's good because it gives us uh, the chance that uh, in a in a relatively short time span, we will already have the chance to see first results of some of these randomized trials um, to really move quickly forward. Well, I can only congratulate um, um, Concept Medical also to run these uh, these programs. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would like to, to join you with the, the congratulations. And of course, a part of this uh, entire discussion, we also need to thank uh, Konstantinos to ignite, uh, to have ignited the, the discussion uh, almost two years ago on, uh, on Paclitaxel. I want to thank you all for your participation, extremely uh, nice presentations.
I want to thank you, uh, Dirk, for joining us at AMP Europe 2020. And I want to thank uh, Concept Medical for supporting this session and all the support they gave for the uh, meeting. Thank you very much. And we're going to swift, uh, switch uh, instantly to the next session, session number seven, comprehensive approach to CLI therapy. All hands on deck are needed. And Michael Mansi will moderate this and just give us uh, some time, one minute to change. Thank you again, all of you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.